started. Welcome everyone to week four of CRIM 103. Before we talk about the themes for today's lecture and what we'll focus on, just as a reminder that the midterm quiz is next week and it's live on Canvas. So there'll be instructions that you'll be able to find on Canvas to tell you about how you'll be writing the exam. But essentially you'll be in front of your computer, you'll log on to Canvas, and you'll put your Zoom, you'll up sign into Zoom and there'll be a link for you. And you need to have your camera on so that TAs and I can observe everyone, make sure nobody is engaging in any academic dishonesty during the midterm quiz. The quiz is gonna be very, very short. Some of you will finish it in 15, 20 minutes. It's only about 60 questions. All the questions are either multiple choice or true and false. All of the material on the quiz will be based on the readings and the lectures through today's or this week's lecture. So the focus is going to be on especially material that we've talked about in lecture. Don't worry so much about the material in the textbook. There's, I'd say about 100%, like 100% of the questions on the midterm quiz will be questions that I would have answered or addressed in lecture. So the the book can be helpful for giving you a better understanding of things or clarifying things, but 100% of the questions that I place on the midterm will be based on the lecture material that we've sort of gone through uh, up until the end of today's lecture. So for week four, there are four major lecture themes. The first is going to focus on uh, control theories, which is basically going to look at why people do not commit crime. And then we'll transition to talking about a life course theoretical perspective on crime called the age grade theory of informal social control. It was developed by Robert Sampson and John Love. And then we'll talk a little bit about learning theories. So we just sometimes refer to as blank slate theories. We'll talk about differential association, differential association reinforcement theory, social learning theory. And then we'll talk finally about as the fourth theme the different ways that the criminal justice system has tried to intervene with individuals involved in crime and which of these intervention strategies has been most effective in helping people avoid further involvement in criminal behavior. So we'll get started with control theories, which is again looking at why individuals do not commit crime. To think about control theories, we can actually go all the way back to Sigmund Freud. So Freud never talked about criminal behavior, or never was really considered himself to be a criminologist. I don't really like talking about Freud in this class too much because ultimately a lot of his theories were a lot of nonsense. Like ideas about the Oedipal complex, the, the Electra complex, these are all things that really didn't have any empirical merit. And so I don't want to spend a lot of time drilling into students' heads these ideas that were never really too accurate to begin with. And if you take, I believe it's CRIM 312, it's like the history of criminology. They'll talk, there's a book that you'll read that will talk a little bit about Freud. And he's known for the psychodynamic perspective, which essentially says that individuals have to go through different developmental stages. They have to progress through different developmental stages in a normative way in order to avoid engaging in delinquent behavior. One of the things that uh, was also true about Freud was that he actually spent most of his time not on psychodynamic theory, but actually experimenting with drugs because he was also really interested in dentistry and he wanted to figure out uh, the best way to develop an anesthetic. And he thought that cocaine would be a really good anesthetic to use in dentistry. So he spent a lot of time using cocaine and basically experimented with a lot of different drugs and this might explain some of his particularly odd theoretical perspectives. What it came down to is he developed theoretical perspectives to explain why people would not engage in misbehavior. So when he was talking about the id, the ego, and the superego, he was talking about the ability to regulate behavior, to avoid doing something. And so even though these ideas are hundreds of years, about almost 200 years old now, um, we can still see them emerge and form the basis of some more contemporary criminological theories. One of the 
building blocks to control theories within the field of criminology is Hershey's social bond theory, which was developed in 1969. And by the way, for the purposes of the quiz, I'll never test students on percentages or years. So like, you don't need to know that Hershey's social bond theory was developed in 1969. I'm just saying that for context but really it's something that I don't think is especially important for students to know. What I want you to spend more time understanding are concepts and ideas and evidence as opposed to names and dates and percentages. When it comes to Hershey's social bond theory, he specified that there were four types of bonds that could help prevent people from becoming involved in criminal behavior. So he specified these four bonds as attachment, commitment, involvement, and belief. So attachment deals with somebody's closeness to other people. You don't want to go out and engage in criminal behavior because it might damage that relationship. He also talked about commitment, where if you are invested in a particular, let's say like an after school activity or an after work activity, if you're a part of a team, if you're a part of a improv group, doesn't really matter what it is. The time spent on this conventional activity means that you don't want to engage in criminal behavior because you might no longer be able to be part of that group. And so you don't want to lose out on your investment. If you've put all this effort, time, energy, and passion into this project or to you know, becoming a good athlete, you don't want to lose out on this investment by engaging in criminal behavior, which could jeopardize your role on that group or on that team sounds a lot like commitment, but it's really important that students understand the difference between involvement and commitment. Commitment is about the actual activity and caring about not losing your stake in that group. Involvement is simply about spending so much time doing pro-social things that the individual simply does not have time for antisocial activity. So you know, they wake up in the morning and they might have you know those, especially when you're a young kid, the early morning hockey practices at 5, 6, 7 a.m. You're off to school. After school, you're doing homework. Maybe you're playing street hockey with friends. And then it's dinner time, and then you're watching a show, and then you have like no room, no actual time to go out and engage in criminal behavior. The last social bond is belief. And this is the idea that individuals adhere to and respect sort of conventional social norms. So this can, Hershey was often referring to religion, but this can refer to any sort of code of conduct, conduct or expectation within a social group about how people are going to behave. So when it comes to social bond theory, one of the problems I think exists with social bond theory is that when Hershey was talking about attachment, he said that you could be attached to anybody. It did not matter who you were attached to, if you had an attachment, that would help prevent the individual from becoming involved in crime. We'll see later in today's lecture that social learning theory says we need to be careful about this type of statement because an individual might be attached to somebody who goes around and engages in criminal behavior. This individual that they're attached to might be a negative influence. So Hershey didn't really think about these negative influences, didn't really think about antisocial peer groups, didn't think about beliefs within an individual's peer group that are actually supportive of crime. One of the reasons why Hershey wasn't really thinking about this is because he came from Utah and he came from a Mormon community where there was really not any criminal behavior. This is kind of what gave him the idea of thinking about, well, why do people not commit crime? I'll look at sort of my community, what I've seen around me, and I'll use that to explain or understand why people do not engage in crime. So one of the problems with this theory is that it might not be especially generalizable. What I mean by that is, can we take this theory and use it to explain criminal behavior or a lack of criminal behavior in a particularly high crime neighborhood or a neighborhood that might not look as affluent as some of the Mormon communities that Hershey was talking about? Another thing that we need to consider about Hershey's social bond theory is whether it can be helpful in explaining individuals with mental disorders or individuals involved in particularly serious and violent crimes. So for example, if we look at one particularly serious case of a serial offender named Colonel Russell Williams, who was a pilot in the Canadian Royal Air Force, 
he seemed to have a lot of the social bonds that Hershey was talking about. He was married, so he had some levels of attachment. He was highly committed to his job because he was a decorated Air Force pilot. The job itself required him to be involved very heavily in, I would guess, that I would say pro-social activities. He was responsible for flying, I believe, like the Queen of England around. He was somebody who his job took up a lot of time. And so that time should be leaving him less available to go out and perpetrate criminal behavior. But as we saw, he engaged in a lot of sexual offenses, deviant sexual offenses, and engaged in homicide offenses. So we need to begin to think about in what scenarios might certain theories not actually be all that applicable to certain types of crime? Here's one of the reasons why Hershey's social bond theory might not apply to all individuals, especially persons that are involved in uh, a long history of serious and violent offenses. So we'll talk a little about this individual that I interviewed for quite a period of time. One of it, we'll, we'll call him Justin just for, for the purposes of this discussion, it's not actually his name, but Justin was very attached to his mother. However, his mother was very severely drug addicted, um, especially to crystal meth. And his mother was not necessarily a great influence on him. By the time Justin was around 11, 12 years old, he was robbing people to get money for his mom to help her support her drug habit. His mom did not treat his other siblings very well. In fact, his mother had an affair with Justin's sister's boyfriend. Sister's boyfriend became the mom's boyfriend and they spent a lot of their time in a, a locked room basically just doing drugs all day. And the mother would sometimes support herself uh, and her drug habit by being involved in sex trade work. But Justin didn't have a lot of positive support at home and his involvement in criminal behavior to help support his mother. So he was basically the primary caregiver for his mother. He was just a kid and he didn't really know what was right or wrong for his mom. So he was engaging in crime to basically get money to help feed her drug habit. This eventually led to Justin being involved in the youth justice system and the youth justice system said that we're going to take you out of your family home and place you in a group home and one of the conditions of your probation is that you have to reside in this group home but Justin would frequently AWOL his group home to go and check in on his mother and his mother would say things to him like if you didn't come to check in on me I would like you're the only one that cares about me and if you didn't do this I would kill myself so Justin's mother is basically telling him that if he does not leave his group home and sort of violate the conditions of his release, she would engage in self-harm. So here's where Justin does have a very strong attachment to a person, but this person is also influencing his continued involvement in the criminal justice system. So he would AWOL his group home and the group home eventually kicked them out because they needed to find the space for kids that were actually going to stay there. So he begins to have a lack of sort of a stable home environment that sort of continues to perpetuate his involvement in criminal behavior. So this is why I think when we talk about Hershey's social bond theory and other criminological theories, we really need to delve into the nuance of what these relationships actually look like and how they can negatively impact somebody's ability to avoid involvement in crime. And so that's why we need to think also about some of these psychological aspects of criminal behavior. So Hershey actually transitioned away from his on theory, or his, which is a type of control theory. And towards the late 1980s, he began working with Michael Godfreyson to attack longitudinal research. So Hershey did not like research that involved following individuals up over time. And some of the background of this is that he had applied for a, a major grant in the United States that was worth like multi-million dollars. And other researchers who had also applied for the grant and specified a longitudinal component to it, ended up getting the grant. So Hershey lost out on a grant because 
he used what we would call a cross-sectional research design, which means you just interview people at one time period and then move on. So by sort of losing out on this grant, he was very frustrated with the sort of the state of criminology and people's opinions about the value of longitudinal research. They began to develop what they called the general theory of crime. And basically, they tried to target every single theory that had ever been written within criminology ever. So it was really kind of like attacking everybody else in the field of criminology through their general theory of crime. So like we've seen some fairly large feuds over the time between Tupac and Biggie. We've seen feuds between uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson and different flat earthers. And in, so the field of criminology, one of the biggest views that we've seen is between, we'll see, I think it will be on your right, Godverson and Hershey, and then the single picture there of Robert Sampson and John Law. Again, names that aren't really important for you, but again, just to try and give you some context about what's going on. Godverson and Hershey said that longitudinal research did not matter at all. Sampson and Lobb had actually been following individuals from the time they were about eight, nine years old to about age 70. So longitudinal research was extremely important to them. So in Garson and Hershey's General Theory of Crime, they wrote a book that presented basically no empirical evidence. So no actual research. They just targeted every other theory within the field of criminology and said that it was flat out wrong. And so this led to their theory that they proposed as the way to basically understand all crime all the time. So they explained that one construct called low self-control could explain all offending by all people and all types of offenses. So whether we're talking about sexual offenses, robbery, homicide offenses, white collar crime, they suggested that low self-control was the cause of all of these things. What is low self-control? So According to Garbs and Hershey, they said that low self-control characterizes people who are impulsive, they're insensitive, so like to the feelings and emotions of other people. They have a preference for physical as opposed to mental activity. They're risk-taking, they're short-sighted, so they don't really think about the consequences of their behavior. They tend to not have long-term goals. They tend to be non-verbal, so they'd rather communicate physically than like explaining how they're feeling or what they want. So Godfrey and Hershey stuck with this control theory of crime concept by saying that something had to happen for individuals to develop self-control. So they were explaining why crime does not occur. Crime would not occur if an individual develops self-control. And self-control would develop, they would say, like by about age 8 to 10. So if an individual develops self-control by age 8 to 10, they would have self-control for the rest of their life. They also said that if an individual did not develop self-control by age 8 to 10, so if they had low self-control, they would have low self-control for the rest of their life. What's kind of ironic about this perspective is that to test the accuracy of this theory, to see if somebody would have low self-control or not have low self-control for the rest of their life, you would actually need to conduct longitudinal research. So how do individuals develop self-control? So it wasn't that something happens and individuals have low self-control. Basically, Garfield and Hershey suggest that individuals are sort of born with low self-control, but by age eight to 10, they can develop self-control. The way that individuals develop self-control is through proper parenting practices. So parents have to do three things properly. They have to be able to supervise their child. They have to be able to like look at the child, be in the same room, monitor their behavior. Then they have to also be able to, while supervising the child, recognize when they're engaging in poor behavior. They can't just be in the room sort of as this passive actor. They have to actually recognize when the child's behavior is inappropriate. So if they hit their sibling with their toy, the parent has to recognize that this is a behavior that needs to be corrected. The third thing that must be done, and all three of these things have to be done, if two of them are done but not the third, then an individual will continue to have low levels of self-control. So the third thing is that the parent needs to understand how to appropriately respond to this behavior. They need to understand 
okay, so my child just hit my other child with their toy. How am I going to respond to this child in a way that is going to teach them that what they're doing is wrong, but also not through things like being very coarse. If we remember last week we talked about authoritarian parenting styles where the parent might just yell at the child, tell them what they're doing is wrong, but not explain why. Robertson and Hershey said that the parent has to communicate to the child why what they're doing is wrong. So this general theory of crying has been, was developed in 1990 and since this time, there's been a lot of attacks against the general theory of crime by other criminologists. What I would say you should take away from this is that low self-control is very, very important. It's one of the most important risk factors for criminal behavior, but it's not the only thing that matters. So remember, Godfrey and Hershey said that all other risk factors don't matter. If you are born in a high crime neighborhood, if you have parents that are divorced or if a child witnesses the parents engaging in violence towards one another. According to Garth and Hershey, none of this matters. The only thing that matters is low self-control. They're really wrong about that. That doesn't mean that low self-control is not important. It is particularly important, but we need to also consider other factors. And this is one of the things that Samson and Law were really trying to emphasize, especially this Especially this idea that people can change over the life course. Goffs and Hershey assume that people kind of just remain the same over time. Samson and Lobb are what we would call life course criminologists. So unlike Goffs and Hershey that say that by age 8 to 10 we basically know all we need to know about people, Samson and Lobb said we really need to pay attention to people over the, the full life course because there's a lot of change that can happen even for people with maybe some stable personality characteristics. Samson and Law basically developed what they called an age-graded theory of informal social control. Age-graded means that they're suggesting that what matters at one age or age stage in terms of the risk for being involved in crime or protective factors that can keep somebody from committing crime are going to be different over the life course. So at ages eight to 10, maybe parents are the most important factor in a person's life. But then as individuals become a little bit more independent, spend more time at school with peers, peers can be really important, either antisocial or pro-social. And then later on in the life course, as they enter like early stages of adulthood, it could be post-secondary education, employment, stable housing. These would be the most important sort of protective factors against crime. And then later on, things like marriage and parenthood that can also act as protective factors against crime. Samson and Love, in some ways, are also control theorists because they like to think about what happens to explain why people don't engage in crime. So they talked about key turning points, like getting a good job, becoming married to a good partner, and you're not going to want to engage in criminal behavior because of your ties to the partner, becoming a parent, and carrying out the child and so on. So Samson and Lob actually were taking a lot of Hershey's original ideas, so those social bond ideas about attachment, commitment to a job, everything like that, and they built it into their age-graded theory of informal social control. So first off, in terms of like what they did not want, Samson and Lob did not want to see criminology abide by static theories like Goffs and Hershey. They said that a lot of change happens over the life course. So we need to do away with deterministic perspectives, like the idea of cumulative continuity. Another way of saying cumulative continuity is cumulative consequences or cumulative disadvantage. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago with Terry Moffat's theoretical perspective on life course persistent offenders. So Samson and Lobb also disagreed with Terry Moffat. They felt that Moffat's life course persistent theory was too deterministic. This idea that kids at age five, six are gonna be involved in antisocial behavior, and then their risks over time are gonna keep them from experiencing good employment, having a healthy marriage, caring about their children, and so on. So Samson and Lobb were different from both Garfson and Hershey and Terry Moffat. What Samson and Lobb disagreed with was what we call an ontogenetic perspective of crime. This ontogenetic perspective suggests that environment is just a stage for a play. So there are actors or individuals who can operate on their environment or their work on their
minor stage, but the environment doesn't actually influence the individual. The stage doesn't influence the individual. Only the individual can influence their stage or their environment. So Samson and Love talked about sort of what they don't want for criminology. And here's what they do want. So they want longitudinal research that monitors within individual change across multiple developmental periods. When we talk about developmental periods, these are just different age stages, which can also kind of go back to Freudian ideas. But the idea is that people can have really big changes and experience the environment in very different ways according to these different age stages. This is why we need to pay attention to age-graded turning points. The reasons why someone might stop offending at age 24 could be different why someone might stop offending at age 40. So we need to consider that if we're dealing with a particular individual in conflict with the law, the way that we might want to promote their change is going to depend on the age stage that they're in. Samson Law were also really interested in history and the impact of macro-level social events so the impact of the environment on the individual. So remember, the ontogenetic perspective says the environment doesn't really impact the individual. Samson Lob are coming from a sociogenetic perspective and saying that an individual's environment can influence their involvement in criminal behavior. So one of the things that they point to is the acquisition of social capital. Samson and Lob believe that getting a job was very, very important. And one of the ways to get a job is to have social capital that can be you know ties to somebody friends to somebody who has a business that would be more willing to not even accept a resume just hire that person on the spot because they know their family things like that so samson law pointed the fact that in the united states there's been an awful history of slavery there's an awful history of segregation uh, when it comes to african americans due to slavery African Americans were cut off from a lot of social capital ties, the ability to have connections to people that could offer them a job or vouch for them, write them a reference letter, all these sorts of things that can help somebody get their foot in the door. And this is why it's a historical consequence. We don't have slavery in the United States today. However, these historical contexts still impact an individuals to this day because of how slavery cut off people from access to job opportunities that reduces their ability to pass social capital down to their offspring, down to other generations of the family unit. What Samson and Love basically suggested is, they didn't use this analogy, but I'll use it as, uh, if you've ever seen like Cirque du Soleil shows, one of the shows is called Ka, and the actors are on the stage, the act acrobats are on the stage, and the stage will actually move around and flip people off, pick people back up. And so Samson and Love are basically saying that the environment can operate on the individual and we really need to pay attention to this. So this isn't so much a psychological perspective, but I want people to understand that psychology isn't the only way that we explain criminal behavior. Something that I'm especially interested in are the psychological explanations of crime, but we need to have this attention to social structure as well how an economic downturn can impact a person's ability to have opportunities for jobs that can in turn lead to involvement in criminal behavior. Samson and Lobb said that there were several key turning points in a person's life course that could help somebody that was involved in crime stop offending. So the, the five key turning points that they pointed to were military involvement, housing, marriage, children, and employment. Very importantly, keep in mind that they refer to these things as age-graded informal social controls. Having a child at age 18 might not actually be very helpful as a turning point because persons might not be financially stable, they might not be at a certain level of maturity to be able to properly act as a parent. Certainly it's possible, but especially like if you're living in Vancouver, if you are socioeconomically disadvantaged, having a child at age 18, when you have you know, not many job prospects, expensive housing, it can be an extra challenge as opposed to a turning point. Same thing with employment. A researcher by the name of Chris Ugin looked at when does employment help people stop offending? 
And basically what he found was that it wasn't until after the mid 20s that employment acted as a turning point for people that were involved in criminal behavior. Another one that might be a little bit more controversial is military involvement. So for the participation in your tutorial group this week, one of the ways that we can uh, begin some discussion is to think about these turning points, especially military involvement. What do you think about military involvement today? The reason why Samson and Law thought military involvement was important was because at the time that they were doing their analyses, they were studying individuals from the United States that were part of the Korean War. And during the Korean War, when soldiers returned to the United States, they were afforded opportunities under the GI Bill, the General Infantry Bill. This GI Bill gave military personnel subsidized access to housing, so reduced cost to buy a home, uh, subsidized, subsidized or free education. So when these soldiers were returning from war, they were given a lot of opportunities. So think about whether this is true today. Think about what you've heard about the experiences of PTSD amongst men and women in the military uh, currently and think about how this might apply to turning points today. Another key concept that Samson Law talked about was state dependence. State dependence is the idea that each time somebody interacts with the justice system, it limits their opportunities for turning points. When someone gets labeled as an offender, it can impact what they have opportunities to do in the future, such as become employed. Especially in the United States, criminal record checks are very, very common amongst employers. And if an employer finds that somebody has a criminal record, then you might be less likely to employ them. So that individual is less likely to have an opportunity for this turning point. So this is really taking the labeling theory perspective that you might have heard about in CRIM 101 or CRIM 104 and using it in a longitudinal framework where a person's label that they receive from the criminal justice system as an offender can impact their social and structural opportunities. So for example, an individual might be incarcerated in adolescence and then maybe that keeps them out of school. And then they don't have that opportunity to go to school as much and that might be difficult for them to go on and get a job in the future. Similarly, what happens if somebody who's an adolescent gets a criminal record or they're known in their community to engage in criminal behavior? Other parents might not want their own children spending time with this individual and so this individual is cut off from positive pro-social peers because of their involvement in criminal behavior and the labeling that they receive after being convicted of a crime. Same thing can happen if we have um, an adult, 35 years old, rents, and they are incarcerated. By being incarcerated, they are no longer working, they're no longer able to pay rent, so they'll lose out on this subsidized housing. And then when they return to the community, their access to housing is more limited. So that housing opportunity or access isn't going to act as a turning point anymore either person could go be incarcerated and that can cut them off from their family. They may be incarcerated and then because of that, their partner does not want to be with them anymore. They don't have as good of a relationship with their children any longer. And those things that were supposed to act as turning points are no longer really going to apply. So we can see, especially in the United States, how different sanctions can really impact a person's opportunity for jobs especially jobs that you would think maybe don't even really matter when it comes to actually being, does, does being a person that's been in conflict with the law really impact a person's ability to successfully do a particular job? With a criminal record in certain US states, cannot be a barber, cannot be an electrician, some of them are barred from being a trade union, which can be very important for helping such individuals maintain jobs over time. You can't operate a pool hall if you have a criminal record in some, United, in some states in the US. And in some states in the US, you cannot be a plumber if you have a criminal record. The idea, for example, of we'll keep people from being plumbers if they have a criminal record because we don't want them in a person's home because maybe they're going to steal something. But what if a person's criminal record has nothing to do with assault or theft. We see, especially in the United States, a lot of already marginalized people prosecuted for simple possession of drugs. 
what does that have to do with a person's ability to be a pawn? And the reason why we really need to care about these things is they're actually, by barring people from having an opportunity to work certain jobs, you can actually create more difficulties in somebody stopping offending. So while these policies were introduced to try and prevent offending, they might actually be amplifying somebody's risk of involvement in crime. So this isn't going to be on the exam, but let's just take a quick look at an example of how state dependence operates in ways that explain to us why deterrence doesn't work. Here's a look at why deterrence does not work according to Samson Lobb's description of state dependence. There are two types of deterrence, general deterrence and specific deterrence. General deterrence refers to why the criminal justice system has an open court. The justice system will punish people, will make it clear to the general public that this punishment has occurred so that other people will be deterred from committing crime in the future. So general deterrence is about deterring other members of society from engaging in criminal behavior. Specific deterrence, on the other hand, is focusing on the particular individual. The idea that if we punish that individual, they will experience a negative consequence and they won't want to engage in that behavior in the future. Studies evaluating the efficacy of specific deterrence don't really show much support for this idea that punishment actually works. And we can see this even with the most extreme forms of punishment. So when we look at, can't really do this in Canada, but in the United States, we can compare the homicide rates of states before they have the death penalty and then after they added the death penalty. And if they have, didn't have the death penalty and then added it, we didn't see a change in the homicide rate before versus after the death penalty. So adding the death penalty as a punishment didn't deter people from engaging in criminal behavior. It comes to the intersection of deterrence and the state dependence model, we can see from the slide here that an individual might be arrested at, for their first arrest. And this can place strain on their family. It can weaken their attachment to positive family members who might have wanted to help support this individual. Maybe they get arrested a second time because they don't feel these strong ties to family members. And this time when they're arrested, they actually are placed in custody. So this could lead to them missing school or missing out on work, and now they're losing that social capital. So when they're released from custody, now maybe they don't have the same friends at school or they've been fired from their job, and so that could increase their likelihood of a third arrest. That third arrest, maybe other people uh, in their life are now kind of getting fed up with them, and so the only people that are willing to support this individual or spend time with them are individuals who are like-minded, who also are in going to engage in criminal behavior or even encourage this individual to engage in criminal behavior. And this can lead to a fourth arrest. So essentially what we're seeing is that after each arrest or each justice system involvement, an individual's ties to society become weakened, which can increase their likelihood of future offending. I've talked about this a little bit, but I also want to go back to this idea that Samson and Lobb are different from Moffat in certain ways. They both really emphasize the examination of individuals over time. So I talked about developmental criminology being interested in within individual change and between person differences. Life course criminology and life course criminologists like Samson and Lobb are also interested in within individual change and between person differences. But where life course criminology differs from developmental criminology is with the idea that some individuals will remain at risk for continuing to offend throughout the entire life course. According to Moffat in a lot of developmental criminology, life course persistent offenders experience too much cumulative disadvantage to ever really experience positive turning points like employment, like marriage, or at least marriage to a pro-social partner, or having children, and these children are going to be people that the individual truly cares about and wants to abstain from crime, to not disappoint their children or to not have their children taken away from them. Samson and Law, on the other hand, suggest that turning points happen for everybody, regardless of their initial levels of risk. The social structure will funnel individuals into these turning points even if they don't actively seek them or even if they have low social capital or very high risk. Moffat says that 
95% of individuals will experience informal social control. They will experience turning points, but for those like 5% of individuals characterized by a life course persistent offending pattern, they simply are characterized by a high level of risk. This isn't to say that intervention strategies can't reduce this risk and be helpful, but basically it says that if individuals do not get help, they will remain on this life course persistent pattern. Samson and Lobb say that there's like a lot of randomness over the life course and that individuals can also uh, exert human agency where individuals can basically like pull themselves up by their bootstraps and change their life and change their social environment even if they're coming from a high risk background. So let's take a look at some of the differences between Samson and Lobb and Godfrey and Hershey in terms of how their theoretical perspectives contrast. So we can look here and we can see that both agree that childhood low self-control would lead to youth offending. They also think that employment, marriage, and youth offending are important to adult offending. Here's where they really differ though. So if you can see Goffs and Hershey there, the relationship between being unemployed and adult offending and being unmarried and adult offending and youth offending and adult offending all of these relationships or these correlations are spurious. They don't actually directly influence adult offending. Instead, what's going on is that childhood low self-control, according to Garveson and Hershey, is influencing the likelihood that somebody is unemployed. It influences the likelihood that someone is unmarried, and it influences youth offending. So basically, they say that childhood low self-control causes all four of these other circles you see in the dialogue box. So really, as you can see now, Garfield and Hershey say that these three informal social controls and the history of youth offending as a labeling effect or state-dependent effect actually do not matter at all for adult offending. Here's where we can see on the left-hand side, looking at Sampson and Lobb, someone can change from being not married to married, and then that relationship with adult offending will go away. So this is why Sampson and Lobb spend so much time emphasizing change over the life course. They can also say that things like being a youth offender can dissolve or influence the fact that somebody might not become married or impact the quality of the relationship and that can lead to reoffending or adult offending once again. transition now from control theories to learning theories or blank slate theories. These theories suggest that something sort of has to happen for an individual to become good or to become not good. So again, one of the things that we want to do in criminology is avoid using certain labels. Like I try to avoid using the term offender to describe people that have committed a criminal offense. I didn't really use, always have this perspective thought it was kind of silly to avoid calling somebody an offender when they've engaged in criminal behavior. But someone pointed out to me that why would we call somebody the thing that we don't want them to continue to do or that we don't want them to become? We want this person to stop offending. Why are we going to call them an offender and give them that identity as somebody that continues to offend? So this is why it's important to think about sort of more person-oriented terms like a person who's involved in criminal behavior or a person in conflict with the law as opposed to labels like offender. So when we're looking at blank slate theories, we can begin to think about three different ways of formulating these theories. And we'll talk about them sort of in the in temporal order, so how they've been developed over time. First, we begin with classical conditioning, which assumes that humans can't make really strong free will decisions about what they learn from reward and punishment. Basically the environment just acts on the individual and the individual absorbs whatever their environment exposes them to. They don't really get to decide what it is they learn, what it is they're rewarded or punished by. So the environment solely operates on people. Operant conditioning on the other hand is that people can change their environment. It's not just this one way street. People will learn consequences of their behavior, but they can also shape their environment. They can act on their environment. They're not just this passive actor. 
And what's important to understand is that social learning is not identical to social learning theory. Social learning describes a way of learning. So it's social learning, and then social learning theory is social learning, if that makes sense. So social learning com completely revolutionary from classical conditioning or often conditioning. And that it described learning as a cognitive process, something that can come from seeing other people behave as well. Classical conditioning and offerant conditioning tended to emphasize that individuals had to experience something themselves to learn. Social learning said that no, what people witness can also have an impact on their behavior and what they learn. In the criminal justice system, there are some important terms that we need to know. One is token economy system, and this is what's used in Canada custody systems all throughout the nation. And it's a system that tries to reward positive behavior. So at the Burnaby Youth Custody Center, for example, hopefully post COVID, some of you will have an opportunity to volunteer there because it's a very great place to get some exposure to what kids who are involved in serious and violent offenses are actually like. So at the Burnaby Youth Custody Center, they use a token economy system that places individuals on four levels. The better behaved you are, the higher in the level you'll progress. You start at level two, but you can be downgraded to level one with poor behavior, but you want to reach level four. The different levels dictate the time that you are sent to your room for bed. So level one, the individual gets locked up at 8.30 p.m. Level two, 9 p.m., level three, 9.30, level four, 10 p.m. They don't force kids to go to sleep then, but that's when they say like, okay, you're in your room, you don't get to roam about the unit or watch TV out on the unit anymore. Individuals that are individuals that engage in positive behavior, they'll receive a higher reward, and then like they'll be on a higher level, and they will get actually paid for the points that they earn. Their level is based on different criteria like personal hygiene, attending school, attending programs, engaging well with peers, and engaging well with staff. So they can earn like, I think it's five points for each criteria. If you're on level one, you might earn two cents per point. But once you get up to level two, you earn three cents per point, and then four cents per point, five cents per point. And these points are scored at three times throughout the day. So there's more money that you can make for the more well-behaved you are. You also get certain other privileges that you still allow kids to bring in and wear their own shoes. Back when I was interviewing kids, they loved their Nike shocks. So I think they've probably transitioned to Yeezys or something like that at this point. They would do whatever they could to get to level four because they wanted to be able to wear their own sneakers while in the custody center. And it sounds like a very silly thing, but this is what worked for kids and it's why it's important to pay attention to what the individuals are actually interested in or inspired by to engage in positive behavior. So the token economy system is much different from the deterrent system, which says let's punish people for bad behavior. The token economy system acknowledges that poor behavior needs to be punished, but it also is interested in rewarding people for positive behavior. Another key term is discriminative stimuli. This sort of helps us give a, get an understanding of normative, de normative definitions of what groups value or what groups view certain behavior as positive or as negative. So for example, there was a culture in the custody center of being able to get your own shoes was a very positive thing, something to work for. So other kids that might be near the custody center get exposed to this culture of this is okay behavior, this is not okay behavior. Fundamental attribution error is where we have a tendency to blame individuals and completely ignore uh, other factors in their environment that might contribute to their negative behavior. For example, a, a good example of this would be individuals with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. These are individuals who in utero, so it would be a prenatal risk factor, their mother would drink or use drugs, and they were born with this very serious neurological disorder that impacts executive functioning. So for somebody with FASD, they're gonna have a very difficult time just doing daily tasks, like being able to cook a meal, because it requires you to follow different steps. So let's say that we've got an individual who's now living on their own, 19 years old, 
they need to go to the grocery store. So they need to figure out how they get from the grocery store, from their home to the grocery store. What bus do they take? How much change do they need for the bus? When they're in the grocery store, what are the ingredients that they need to buy? How, do they have enough money for this? Do they know how to get back home after which bus to take? These are all things that can really add stress to an individual's life, can make them react very negatively. So they might get back on the bus and they don't have enough change and they get frustrated, they don't know what to do and they assault the bus driver. So from a public perspective, we might just see that this individual is out of their mind for assaulting a bus driver over a matter of not having enough fare. What we need to understand is this individual was born with severe impairments that make it difficult for them to function the way that we might. So we need to understand these environmental factors as well that are relating to these really uh, serious neurological disorders that can impact behavior. One of the other things that I know about uh, working with kids with FASD, what I learned from some colleagues was if you are working with this population, you can phrase questions and phrase statements in particularly, particular ways that can help avoid their escalation in negative behavior. So for example, for custody staff who might be required to tell a kid with FASD that it's time for them to go to their room. So maybe they're playing cards on their unit and now they have to go to bed. The staff member says to the individual, you have to stop playing cards now. That individual might get very frustrated, not because they're being told what to do. It's not like they have oppositional defiant disorder where they want to fight back at somebody who is telling them what to do. In fact, for kids with FASD or adults with FASD for that matter, they're often looking to mentors or older people in their environment to tell them what to do because they have a very difficult time processing situations and understanding how they're supposed to behave. This is why people with FASD can often be manipulated into committing crime or engaging in misbehavior because they're looking to peers, they're looking to older people to sort of get feedback on how they're supposed to behave. If they're told that they can't play cards, they might negatively react and throw the cards away or cause sort of a scene. And the reason why they might be doing this, it's not because they're being told what to do, it's because they're unsure of what they're now allowed to do. They're not sure what the next step is. They can't figure out what they could do in place of cards. So they don't know, okay, I can brush my teeth, I can go to my room, I can listen to my radio in my room, and so on. So what a staff member can do to help avoid these escalations and conflict is to say, so you need to stop playing cards now because it's time for lock up, it's time for bed. But here are the things that you can do when you are in your room. We can let you have the radio, you can have your book, you can have this, you can have that. These are the other things that you can do. And that can help de-escalate some of the conflict. Before we talk about those three types of learning, remember it's classical conditioning, off-front conditioning, and social learning, we'll look a little bit further back in time to the study of behaviorism, which represents the founding, or the foundation of these different learning theories. Behaviorism is the psychology of action, and it was developed by John Watson, who really wanted to make psychology a hard science. He suggested that we need to move away from Freudian ideas of looking at how people might internalize things or their thinking processes. He said we can't learn anything from examining mental processes. We should only study that which we can directly observe. So just like any of the hard sciences, we should only be looking at things that we can directly measure. So one of the ideas that Watson has had was that humans don't have free will. Thoughts are not actually mental processes. They're physical ones, and we need to measure these physical things. One of the experiments that Watson did to sort of demonstrate learning was an experiment on a child named Little Albert. So what Watson did was expose little Albert to, I can't remember if it was a mouse or a rat, something sort of white, fluffy, fuzzy. And when this individual would be exposed to, let's just say, the mouse, a huge clang would happen to scare the child. They'd take the mouse away and then bring it back, clang, make this big noise. And eventually they were basically trying to pair seeing a mouse with fear. So they're pairing this clang, this big loud noise that scares the child 
with the mouse, and then they associate the mouse with this fearful response. This is to say that it wasn't the mouse that had scared them initially, it was the big loud noise. But now they associate this mouse with this loud noise. What happened according to reports of this study is that little Albert then became fearful, not just of mice, but anything that was white and fluffy, whether it's Santa Claus, stuffed animals, anything like that. And so this was viewed to be an extremely unethical experiment because, and again, we don't really refer to it as an experiment because there was no treatment for control group, but the idea that they did not do anything to get rid of this conditioned response. They allowed little Albert to continue to associate these white fluffy things with a, a fearful response, so they would get upset constantly. I'll post to Canvas some links of some documentaries that you can watch about Little Albert. There have been a lot of studies trying to follow up and find Little Albert to see what happened to him later on in life. Some people have suggested that he actually died at a very young age because he was actually born with some sort of neurological disorder to begin with and that might actually have also been related to why he was uh, fearful of different things. Starting with classical conditioning, this is the work of B.F. Skinner. He was a little bit different from Watson. He believed that thoughts do exist, it's just that they cannot be seen. But like Watson, he wanted psychology to be this hard science. Behavior can directly be caused by environment, and this free will is a myth. So he, he and Watson shared a lot of similar ideas. One of the things that was very forward thinking from Skinner was he suggested that it was better to try to extinguish an event than punish one. To extinguish an event means to just almost ignore the behavior, provide zero response to it. He suggested that punishing the behavior is only going to suppress behavior. And this idea now is actually a really big part of a lot of the ways that we think about responding to offending. For individuals that are low risk, we want to respond with a low intensity treatment or intervention. So for example, police now, if they find a, a kid who is engaged in, let's say it's stealing from 7-Eleven or something like that, it's their, their first uh, contact, negative contact with police, the police are likely to do absolutely nothing in this case because the punishment can be result in things like labeling and that simply letting the kid go, maybe a warning or something like that, but not really any punishment, will allow the behavior to just sort of extinguish on its own. The individual will correct their behavior on their own. So this is part of the philosophy of a model that's very key to the Canadian criminal justice system, but also justice systems throughout the world, called the risk-need-responsivity model. This is something that was developed in Canada, actually partly in BC, by two researchers named Andrews and Bonta. And there are three arms to the risk, need, and responsibility. The risk arm is about figuring out what a person's level of risk is. So are they a, a low risk to reoffend, a moderate risk, or a high risk? The needs aspect or arm of the r, &R model suggests that we need to figure out what their specific risk factors and protective factors are so that we can develop the right treatment program that targets those risk factors or protective factors. The responsivity arm of the model focuses on the type of treatment that the individual would be most likely to benefit from. Would they benefit most from cognitive behavioral therapy or multi-systemic therapy? Would they benefit most from group counseling or individual level counseling? So the reason why the r, &R model fits with classical conditioning is because if we identify somebody with a low risk, the r, &R model says that we don't want to implement a high intensity intervention because that might actually increase this individual's likelihood of offending in the future. For a particularly low risk person with not a lot of risk factors, not a lot of needs, the best thing to do might be nothing. Everyone's heard the classic description of Pavlov and the dog and the bell and producing a conditioned response. So let's take a look at what, how this happens and what these key terms refer to. So at its core, a neutral stimulus when paired with an unconditioned stimulus is able to produce a conditioned response even when the unconditional stimulus is removed. 
the neutral stimulus then becomes a conditioned stimulus. So let's go back and look at some of these key terms. The neutral stimulus is something like a bell. When it rings, we wouldn't normally salivate. We wouldn't really have any response. That's why it's called neutral. An unconditioned stimulus is something in the environment that produces a natural response. So for example, salivation. We would not necessarily think or try to salivate when we see meat. We would just, for something we really want to eat, we would just naturally spawn, respond by salivating. However, if we pair the bell, which is the neutral stimulus, the meat, which is the unconditional stimulus, we can begin to create a conditioned response. So that natural salivation, that's considered an unconditional response. There's no reason for it other than it's sort of innate. The conditioned response is when we then begin to salivate just by hearing a bell. So when the unconditional response like meat is removed, the bell becomes this conditioned stimulus. It creates a conditioned response in the person. Extinction can also happen. So for the unconditional stimulus, if it's constantly removed, we're no longer going to salivate if only exposed to the neutral stimulus. One of the things that initial psychological treatments of offenders try to do is use aversive conditioning by exposing someone to something that they enjoy and pairing it with an unpleasant stimulus. So one of the ways that they tried this was with individuals that committed sexual offenses. What happened would be they would expose the offender to a description of a sexual assault against the child or a sexual assault against someone else, and then they would pair it with a electroshock. That way they would begin to associate their behavior with this negative response. Ultimately, though, this had no real impact on reductions in offending, and some were actually concerned that this could increase the likelihood of offending because what would happen is the individual would begin to associate sort of sexual pleasure and, play and pain, and that this would lead to further involvement in sexual offenses. A good example of classical conditioning in action is a more recent example as in our office episodes. So we'll take a look at this. And then in the comments section on Canvas, I want you to tell me what you think you saw in this video in terms of what was the neutral stimulus, what was the unconditioned stimulus, and what was the conditioned response. Turning now from classical conditioning to operant conditioning, operant conditioning places a bit more weight on a person's environment and that we're going to react based on how our environment responds to our behavior. So it's not just a complete absence of free will that classical conditioning has discussed. When it comes to operant conditioning, there are two ways to change behavior, through reinforcement or through punishment. And each of reinforcement and punishment can be applied in a positive way or a negative way. So positive reinforcement refers to the application of something that an individual wants. Reinforcement is always trying to get somebody to continue the behavior. Punishment is always trying to get someone to stop the behavior. When we use the terms positive and negative, we're not using them as synonyms for good and bad. We're using them more like math terms. So positive is to add something. Negative is to take something away. So when it comes to reinforcement, positive reinforcement is the adding of something that somebody would enjoy. Negative reinforcement is taking away something that somebody does not enjoy to get the behavior to continue. An example of positive reinforcement would be a child engaging in a series, a series of chores and then parents rewarding that child with an allowance. So this will encourage the child to continue to engage in that behavior of completing their chores. A example of negative reinforcement would be, for example, if you were to get in your car and you start pulling out of the driveway but you haven't turned your seatbelt on, your car's going to make that ding, 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 ding sound until you put your seatbelt on. By putting your seatbelt on, you now get rid of that negative stimulus in your environment, that dinging noise. So it's reinforcing that if you put that seatbelt on, will take away this negative thing in your environment. When we talk about punishment, we can talk about the application of punishment, which is positive punishment. Here we could see, for example, corporal punishment. 
This is not necessarily going to be effective in changing the behavior, but it's something that people have tried, especially in the past, through spanking and so on, to get somebody to stop engaging in that particular behavior. On the other hand, we have negative punishment, which is the removal of something that somebody would enjoy. So if somebody does not engage in chores or is just sitting around inside the house all day and the parent wants to uh, respond to this child and punish them, they might take away their PlayStation and not allow them on the computer as a way to tell them that if you continue with the behavior of sitting around, not doing chores, not being productive, you're going to lose certain privileges. Social learning represents a bit of a radical transformation from how classical and awkward conditioning viewed the ways that people learn. Social learning said that people acquire behaviors through the environment and they replicate these behaviors if, especially if they're going to be reinforced by others. So social learning began to say that we need to pay attention to not just how an individual's environment responds to them or influences the individual, but how the individual sees their environment and wants to change or continue their behaviors based on environmental responses. So there are two key terms to social learning. One is differential association, which is where we learn by watching others. Differential reinforcement refers to how we learn based on how individuals respond to our own behavior. So traditional learning theories really do not think about the cognitive processes that go on, like memory. If we engage in a behavior, and we are immediately rewarded or immediately punished, we're more likely to learn from that than behavior that happens at time one, and then several hours or days or weeks go by, and then we're punished or rewarded. The immediate response is what is going to be more likely to improve the likelihood that persons learn from their behavior. Social learning also says that we need to pay attention to social context, that not all individuals who reward or punish behavior will have the same effect on an individual's experience of learning. We can have certain individuals that we admire, that we respect, that we look up to, and these are individuals that are more likely to shape somebody's behavior than an individual that might be a stranger. Learning theories were basically all derived from psychology and by psychologists. And so criminologists didn't really have much say in the development of these different ways of learning and ideas about learning but they have taken these ideas and adapted them into criminological theories. What's very ironic is differential association theory, which was developed by Edwin Sutherland, is maybe one of the most, Edwin Sutherland is one of the most famous criminologists of all time. The most prestigious award in our field is based on, it's called like the Edwin Sutherland Award. Edwin Sutherland actually hated psychology. He tried to get rid of all psychological explanations of criminal behavior. He wanted criminology to be solely the discipline of sociologists. It's ironic because his differential association theory is really based on psychological <laughs> principles. So he acknowledged that individuals learn by watching others and who they associate with. So you can see the, the picture here is from the film Trainspotting, and you can see in this movie a good example of how drug use and other illegal behaviors are learned from an individual's peer group. So the process of learning criminal behavior can come by associating with other individuals involved in criminal behavior. Frequency refers to how often an individual is exposed to a particular behavior. Like, so that they repeatedly see somebody engage in criminal behavior. Duration refers to how long over what period of time have they been witnessing this type of behavior actually occur. Priority refers to who is actually engaging in the behavior. An individual will place more weight on the behaviors engaged in by their closest friends compared to other people that just happen to be peers in the classroom or people at work versus people that are in your more intimate social circle, family, friends, and so on. Intensity refers to the strength to which somebody is actually going to be rewarded for that particular behavior. Was it an extreme reward or just a small reward? Was it an extreme punishment or just a small punishment? Differential association is all about an individual's exposure to other people and learning from these other people. Others looked at Sutherland's differential association theory and said that something was definitely missing. 
we need to also account for how a person's criminal behavior is responded to by their environment. So it's not just what you see, but it's how others respond to behaviors. The idea of differential reinforcement is really just directly taking themes from operant conditioning and social learning and looking at how the individual might be rewarded for criminal behavior or punished for criminal behavior. The criminal behavior of individuals is really dependent on the response to their initial criminal. What differential reinforcement theory fails to account for is how the individual's criminal behavior actually began in the first place. Saying that individuals will commit criminal behavior if somebody responded positively to their criminal so that leaves the question of how did criminal behavior actually emerge in the first place? So Ronald Akers developed what we in criminology refer to as social learning theory. He basically took, to, took Sutherland's ideas of differential association and C. Ray Jeffrey's ideas of differential reinforcement and bound them together. He said that we need both. We learn by doing and learn by watching. So social learning theory is sometimes referred to the differential association reinforcement theory or DART. It's the DART. They call us the DART. This is the idea of DART. It's looking at the strength of deviancy as being determined by the amount, frequency, and probability of reinforcement. It's all about the level of reward that someone receives, whether they constantly receive that reward, and whether that reward, if they, like, if they have a very low probability of being punished, they're probably going to keep going on with that behavior. They have a very low probability of being rewarded, they're probably not going to continue that behavior. Akers said that we need to look at multiple different models. So people who can model behavior or respond to an individual's behavior. The three models that he felt were most important were the family, peers, and the media. You need to pay attention not just to like how many times is an individual rewarded or punished, but who is doing the rewarding and who is doing the punishing. That's going to dictate whether they're going to respond to that behavior favorably or unfavorably. Whether people learn from the media is a very sort of hot topic within a lot of criminological textbooks. And however, there's some fairly strong agreement that what an individual sees on TV or in film is not going to have a dramatic impact on their behavior. The impact of a video game, a violent video game on somebody else's aggressive behavior is more likely if the viewer is at a younger age, if the viewer is already characterized as being aggressive, so they like aggression to begin with and they're seeking out this type of theme, if there's a way for the individual to identify strongly with the aggressive character. So kids might be more likely to replicate what they see when watching a video game or playing a video game if the character is the protagonist and not the antagonist more realistic the scenes are, the more likely the child is to actually replicate that type of behavior. Especially if the behavior in the movie or in the video game is viewed as justified, like not over the top that the other person had done something wrong, or the behavior was in response to protecting oneself. It's also important for the parents to intervene when the child is watching it. So if the parents explain you know, the difference between right and wrong, that this is a movie that's not real, then the child is less likely to actually replicate the behavior. So the general conclusion that many researchers have come to when it comes to the influence of video games, movies, TV, music, is that individuals who engage in violent behavior, maybe they watch violent movies, but it's because they already have this tendency to be aggressive and they seek out these violent movies, they seek out these violent video games, and that's and that the correlation between playing video games and actually being aggressive is entirely spurious. There's not actually a relationship between video game violence and an individual's actual perpetration of violence. So here's what you'll see in the media very commonly, like all the way back to if you look at Columbine, and there was a big focus on Marilyn Manson, and I think they played Duke Nukem or Doom or something like that. We can see in more contemporary examples of individuals who played violent video games and the media tends to focus on this aspect. The reason why violent video games are a very poor predictor of aggression 
It's because of that false positive problem that we talked about last week. There are so many people that play violent video games that do not engage in criminal behavior, that do not engage in violent crime. So that's why video games are not very useful in helping us understand who will or will not engage in violent crime. Too many people play violent video games and do not engage in crime. Often the media will focus on the fact that individual A engaged in this horrific homicide offense and they also played video games so these two must be linked. Maybe it's linked in this particular case but it's not very generalizable. Learning theories have had a very big role to play in the shaping of our justice system. There are three key principles of the justice system that are very much based on learning theory. These three principles are severity, celerity, and certainty. Severity refers to the proportionality of the response. The severity of the punishment must match the severity of the behavior. So this is all about an individual will be more likely to learn from their poor behavior if the response is justified, if it's not over the top or not enough to actually deter the behavior in the future. Celerity refers to the swiftness of the response. If there is too much of a delay between the behavior itself and the punishment, the individual is less likely to connect the two. You see pictures of puppies here because that's exactly what you need to think about if you're training a, a puppy to try and not pee inside the house or not go to the bathroom inside the house. If you go out for an hour and you come back and you find that the, your puppy has left a mess for you on your living room carpet, if you get angry at the puppy for doing that, they're going to have no idea why you're upset because they can't connect the behavior that they engaged in, peeing on the carpet, with your punishment as a response. So much for them has happened since that time that they can't connect the punishment to their initial behavior. So this is the same principle in the justice system. We want to make sure that the response is swift so that people are more likely to learn from their behavior. Certainly refers to the probability of punishment. Will the individual actually receive punishment consistently each time they engage in the behavior. So if an individual could commit a hundred bank robberies and only get caught once, they're probably sort of more inclined to engage in that behavior because they know that the probability of punishment is very, very low. showed how social learning theory concepts have helped inform how the justice system is formed. And I think this is really important. Theory has to be useful. It can't just be something that lets us know about individuals or why offending occurs, but doesn't help inform about what we can do to prevent offending in the future and to prevent harm to others. So we need to look at empirical evidence for what does and does not work in terms of criminal justice system responses to persons involved in crime. And a lot of these are informed by theory, looking specifically at what doesn't work. Despite a lot of popular beliefs, especially amongst media, politicians, even like family members, specific and general deterrents tend to not work. And this is true across different offenses. So regardless of the type of offense somebody has committed, punishing them more punitively does not prevent that person from offending in the future. Similarly, punishing a person more punitively does not help other people in this sort of global, broader society actually not go on to offend in the future. So boot camps, scared straight programs, these types of programs do not work in deterring others from engaging in crime in the future. The same thing is true of programs that focus only on psychological functioning, like treating mental health symptoms, but not also looking at the environment that the person is embedded within. So for an example, let's say we use a boot camp program where an individual gets a lot of structure. They have a lot of responsibilities, they get to focus on day-to-day -day tasks that are being guided they're being guided by like a counselor or sort of a drill sergeant or something like that. They might behave appropriately during this boot camp. But this boot camp is really highly structured. They're being told what to do, when to do it, when to wake up, when to eat. When they get back into the real world, their environments are often very, very chaotic. Just think of the example of Justin that I gave where 
His mother is using crystal meth. She's locked herself in a room for days and weeks without really eating, drinking, sleeping, and this individual wants to go check in on her. It's hard for Justin to have this sense of structure when his family life is so chaotic. So that's why these boot camps and deterrence programs typically do not work. As I mentioned, even when we look at murder rates before and after the death penalty, we don't see much of a change. Studies have looked at what if we take individuals of similar characteristics or identical characteristics, we give one person probation and the other person an incarceration sentence. Not much happens in terms of the reduction or increase in criminal behavior for somebody that receives uh, an incarceration sentence versus a probation sentence. The same thing when we look at the length of the incarceration sentence. Giving somebody a longer or shorter custody sentence doesn't seem to matter too much in the overall um, outcome of does the person recidivate, reoffend or not. If you're really interested in this work, there's a guy named Daniel Mears and Jonathan Cochran as well from Florida State University. You can look them up and they've done a lot of work on whether incarceration impacts or leads to a specific deterrence and they tend to say the answer is no. Now, this does not mean that incarceration and punishment are not useful. What incarceration can do is prevent an individual from having an opportunity to offend during the time that they are incarcerated. So if they're a high rate offender, incarcerating them for two years might reduce the amount of offending that they would have committed had they been released over that two year time period. Dangerous offender legislation in Canada basically says that if the court determines that an individual is at a very, very severe risk of harming other people in the future, the individual can be held in custody indefinitely, regardless of the offense that they initially perpetrated, whether it be a robbery or a sexual assault or a homicide. This individual, if found to be a quote-unquote dangerous offender, will be held in custody until the tribunal board deems that they are no longer at a serious risk of harming other people. This is not just a life sentence, it's a sentence that says that this individual will be incarcerated until we believe that this person is no longer at risk to others. So punishment can be helpful in terms of preventing individuals from harming others in the future uh, or during that they would have hurt with they would have been released from custody as opposed to being incarcerated, but we don't tend to see that it has much of an impact on actually specifically deterring individuals from engaging in crime once they are released from custody. Talk a little bit about four things that have been found to work. This isn't to say that they're the only four, just four that we'll focus on in this class. Cognitive behavioral therapy and their risk needs responsivity model are a couple that we'll discuss in a moment. First, we'll mention restorative justice. And this is a specific class you can take. It's CREM 315, usually taught by Brenda Morrison. And the idea behind restorative justice is to bring the victim and the offender together and to have a sort of mediation, to let the person that's committed the offense understand the negative impact that the offense has had on the victim. So restorative justice, I think, can work sometimes because in certain situations, I've, I've, literally I've talked to kids that have said that if they were put in a room with the victim, they would just use that as an opportunity to re-offend against that victim because they don't like that person so much. So individuals with really severe antisocial attitudes, features of psychopathy and so on, might not be great candidates for restorative justice. The type of offense that somebody has committed is not actually indicative of whether restorative justice would or would not work. The Rena Burke case is a great example of a serious offense in which restorative justice was useful. So Rena Burke was a teenage girl living in the Victoria area in BC, and she was murdered by a group of teenagers, including Kelly Ellard and Warren Blowatsky. Kelly Ellard never really acknowledged her role in the offense. She was found, despite being found guilty, she never really showed any remorse for the crime. She seemed to indicate some features of psychopathy, so she was never a great candidate for restorative justice. Glowatsky, on the other hand, had a lot of remorse for his offense and engaged in a restorative justice conference with Rena Burke's parents. And 
Lena Burke's parents were so appreciative of Glowatsky's remorse and things like that that they would, you know, they ended up referring to him as a friend, as somebody that they would actually go around the province with and talk about how restorative justice helped them sort of repair the harm that had been done due to the loss of their daughter. Fortunately, Lena Burke's mother passed away about a year or two ago, so they don't do these sort of um, talks anymore, but it's an example of how even a serious offense like homicide can be suitable for restorative justice. Once an individual has been prosecuted and found guilty, one of the things that matters is if the, whether they're on probation or in the custody center, whether it's their case manager, their probation officer, their whoever is the practitioner in the criminal justice system dealing with this individual, a firm but fair practitioner therapy style is very useful. What this means is the practitioner can have empathy, can really try to understand their client's perspective, but also not allow themselves to be manipulated by the client. Because ultimately, these are some individuals who have really antisocial attitudes, and if they think that they can take advantage of somebody, then they'll do so. So having this firm style, but fair style, can be very helpful in developing some rapport between the practitioner and their client, the person that's offended, and this can be helpful for preventing that individual from offending in the future. Cognitive behavioral therapy is a specific type of intervention that focuses on looking at the client and their needs. What are their strengths? What are their challenges? And in what context do problem behaviors occur? And how can these problem behaviors be managed? Or how can individuals learn to manage the situation that they're in to prevent the behavior from actually occurring when they find themselves in some more like high risk context. So in this case, the therapist is focusing on skill building, finding ways for individuals to respond to problems or challenges in appropriate ways. So setting goals, figuring out how to meet those goals is really a big part of cognitive behavioral therapy and it generally proceeds in three steps. Step one is to figure out what the problem is and why does it occur. So maybe some individual is very aggressive, not normally, maybe they're typically very well-mannered or even keel, but they become aggressive in very certain contexts. Like maybe it's when they've been drinking, or maybe it's when they feel that somebody else is insulting them. Step one looks at this problem, figures out how this client normally responds to the problem, and then figuring out what the current script is. And so the term script is something that we're all familiar with. We all follow certain scripts in our day-to-day -day life. Maybe things have changed a little bit since COVID, but let's take a look at like a restaurant, walking into a restaurant as an example. We don't just walk into the restaurant and immediately pick a table. There's usually a wait to be seated sign. We know that a host or hostess is gonna come find us, ask us how many people are in the party, gonna take us to the table. When we sit down, it's not like we order right away from the hostess. We sit down, a waiter or waitress is going to come by, bringing us menus, and usually people will not order their food right away, they'll order some drinks, the person will come back to take their food order, you start with your uh, appetizers, main dessert, then you ask for the check. There's this little like script that we follow, we know how to behave. So step two in the cognitive behavioral therapy process is having an individual develop a better script for responding to, you know, when they're in a bar and somebody bumps into them and they feel that they have to act aggressively. What is a different way that they can handle that situation? What is a new script that they can use? So then the third step is to set goals to put these new skills into practice, how an individual will actually act out that script in everyday life as opposed to talking about that script with the therapist. The last thing that I'll talk about before we end for today's lecture or this week's lecture is the risk need response safety model. I'll talk about it a bit at the beginning of class but I want to go over it again because I think it's fairly interesting just because it was developed by Canadians. It's used routinely in the Canadian criminal justice system. So the three arms of that model are risk, need, and responsivity. Risk is about figuring out an individual's risk for reoffending and the level of intensity of treatment that they're going to require, keeping in mind that high intensity treatments for low risk individuals might actually increase their involvement in criminal behavior. Because for example, let's say we take an individual who just shoplifted from 7-Eleven 
when we put him in custody or her in custody amongst this group of individuals who've committed bank robberies and car thefts, serious aggravated assaults, sexual offenses, and things like that. So first, this individual who's committed a relatively serious offense could begin to learn negative behaviors from other people in custody. But they also could begin to be lumped in with these other individuals as somebody who's committed a really serious offenses and done a lot of really negative or serious harm to other people. The need aspect of the RMR model focuses on the importance of identifying different criminogenic factors underlying different persons involved in crime. And then the goal is to provide guidance regarding the specific skills to work on with the individual. So this might be that once we've identified the intensity of treatment, we need to figure out which factors to respond to. So if we're in cognitive behavioral therapy, we are f be focusing on ways to prevent relapse from using substances. Will we focus on a uh, person's aggressive behavior, how they act in intimate relationships, and so on. Basically, sets in motion what the focus of the intervention strategy will be. And then finally, the responsivity aspect looks at the mode and the style of treatment and says that it has to be matched to the style and capabilities of the person that's going to receive the treatment. Giving somebody group counseling when they're really afraid of talking in front of other people or they're uncomfortable sharing their personal background in front of a group might not be very effective in terms of appropriately responding to that person's needs. So there are two ideas behind responsivity. General responsivity refers to matching the individual to the right type of programming. Adults might benefit a lot from cognitive behavioral therapy. On the other hand, adolescents might prefer to be in a group because maybe that group setting normalizes their experience. They feel that there are other peers that are going through the same things that they're going through and that might make them feel more comfortable talking about things knowing that other people are going through the same things. Young people can be very influenced by their peers. Specific responsivity looks more precisely at matching the individual to a particular therapist, clinician, or practitioner. So it's the idea that uh, things like gender or culture or language can be very important in the rapport that's established between the therapist and the individual receiving the treatment. So individuals might vary in terms of their motivation and readiness for intervention, finding the right person, the right type of individual for providing that intervention can also be very important. So that's it for this week. There is nothing for you to do next week in terms of readings, in terms of lecture. It's all about focusing on the quiz. And then after the quiz, I believe it's, uh, we have a Thanksgiving holiday. And then when we return, I'll talk a little bit about preparing for your term project, how to read empirical articles, how to find empirical articles, and we'll begin to look at these theories that we've talked about so far and begin to apply them to specific types of offenses and understand how specific types of personality disorders and mental health disorders intersect with somebody's involvement in criminal behavior. Take care.